You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello out there, everybody in the world. This is the Common Descent Podcast, episode 146. This episode, we are talking about the Jurassic Cretaceous Transition. Yeah. A bit of an unusual episode topic for us that harkens back to our old Extinction episode series. Uh, Back when we used to talk about mass extinctions, we talked a lot about the boundaries between geologic time periods. This is kind of like those are we talking about a mass extinction uh maybe stay tuned and find out (laughs) only further research will tell whether this episode is like those that is very true (laughs) we're going to talk about what makes this particular band of time particularly interesting sort of some of the geological history the scientific history of what we've been able to tell and what big questions there are about this is an unusual bound there's a lot of boundaries in earth history where we can say yeah this is where the age of dinosaurs ended this is where the ice age began the jurassic cretaceous transition has a lot of interesting stuff about it and a lot of big questions such as was there a mass extinction here or where is the boundary questions like these we will be addressing over the course of this episode (laughs) seem kind of kind of crucial questions (laughs) yeah they are crucial questions it is a fascinating subject And this topic, like all of our episode topics, was requested. Our requesters this time were Jonathan, Evan, and Jason. Good requests. Thank you very much. We're going to get into the main episode. Before we do that, we're going to do some news. And before we do that, some announcements. We have a Patreon. We do. Our Patreon is a place where a bunch of really wonderful fans of ours get to get together, support us financially, allow us to do all the cool things we do on the podcast, and get a bunch of bonus goodies. Bonus news, bonus audio content, director's notes, stuff like that. And also, uh, at a certain level, you get your name shouted out here on the podcast. Yeah. This episode, we would like to shout out (gasps) TH, Sarah, Nathan, Morgan, Mia, Jeff, Jared, Kate, Douglas, and Sean on behalf of Allie. Thank you so much, everybody. Wow, thank you. Huge. We've had a lot of big patron lists these last couple of months because we got a bunch of patrons who signed up to join our special Snakes and Croc Month Patreon stuff we had going on over the summer. Thank you all so much for your support. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's super cool. Speaking of cool things that we get to do, thanks to the support of our listeners, a few other things that are coming up or recent. Number one, we're going back to Dragon Con. Woo! First week in September, shortly after this episode comes out, we will be at DragonCon. We are going to be on a few panels where we will be presenting alongside our scientific colleagues on the science track, namely the Paleontology Hour, Speculative Evolution, and a presentation we're very excited about called Jurassic Park is a Terrible Zoo. Because it is. (laughs) DragonCon's taking place in Atlanta, Georgia, the first week in September. If you're going to be there, come say hi. Also, uh, September means Dragon Con, and after September means October, and October is spooky. Plans are already in the works for this year's series of Spookulative Evolution. We have chosen a topic. Yes, we have. From which we have chosen a list of monsters. We are going to be speculatively evolving. Good one For the spooky season. We're not going to announce the topic on this episode yet. We will announce it next month. But... We will be uh, perhaps posting some teasers and some things. Stay tuned. There will be announcements for what Spooky is going to look like. I'm very excited to see everyone's response. I Oh, man. This one, this one, I'm super excited. And it just becomes, it keeps becoming more and more appropriate. Yes. Yep. <laughs> nope. It's going to be great. Also, a couple things we did recently. We were recently guests on episode 20 of the Jurassic Park podcast a podcast where we got to talk about Jurassic Park and other related themes in paleontology. Link in our episode description for those of you who want to check out our guest appearance. It was a lot of fun. Like We just got to discuss the the story and the book and the film, and it, it was very enjoyable. Yeah. Big thanks to Ryan for inviting us. We had a great time. We were also guests at the Clinton Macomb Public Library Comic Con. 
A couple of our fans, Colleen and Mark, invited us to join, and we patched in and did a couple of presentations there where we got to talk about dinosaurs in movies and the Jurassic Park franchise. Lots of fun. We might share some of that content, uh, depending on how the audio recordings turned out. Yep. Uh, so stay tuned. You might get to see some of that. But uh, yeah, we, we had a ton of fun. We've been doing some guest appearances. It's It's been nice, and it's been nice getting to do some of that stuff with us getting to go back to Dragon Con this year as well. Yes. Like, it's been a, a very refreshing getting to do yes. collaborative things. Uh, so if you're hosting a Comic-Con and you want us to be there, <laughs> yeah, right, let us know. We're open to it. Uh, also, one last thing. Uh, we've got a bunch of cool mail recently. Yeah. Uh, very recently, we got a uh, mail from Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Including a cool Doctor Strange postcard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, as always, Elizabeth. And we mentioned, I think, on the last episode, some other cool fan mail and fan gifts that we got. We got a cool book. We got a cool painting. Mm -hmm. We have posted those on our social media. So you can check out uh, those posts if you want to see what we were talking about. It's pretty cool stuff. All right. Well, it is a busy time of the year, which is why we have a lot of announcements. Yep. But that's all for now. <laughs> on to the news. Every episode, we like to pull some news from the world of paleontology, evolutionary science related things that we're interested in, that you're interested in. Keeps us all nice and up to date. Will, start us with news. My first news, I actually want to reach just a little bit back and tag this onto the end of Croc and Snake Month. All right. Because it is about croc conservation and some new research into how to track which crocs should we can focus our conservation efforts on and how crucial are crocs to their in ecosystems. Well, very cool. This is research by Phoebe Griffin et al. in Functional Ecology, and the article is by Daniel Gillum in the Vigor Times. That article will be linked in our blog post that comes uh, along with this episode. Yes, it will. So to start off, more than half of today's crocodilians are in danger. Sad face. They, they are endangered. Many of those are threatened with extinction, like critically endangered or very near critically endangered at least. This is basically on all counts due to us 100%. Mm -hmm. Hunting, bycatch from fishing, they get caught in nets very often and drown. No. Habitat destruction, the, the same song and dance that we always uh, do in these sad stories. There are, by today's understandings, roughly 28 species, if you include subspecies and recently uh, split groups. And this research was looking at the fact that even though they are very similar in body shape, they have evolved s notably distinct from one another mm -hmm. with different snout shapes, with different feeding habits, you know, different diets and different effects on their environments. Like not each one affects their ecosystem or interacts with it the same as the others. What this research aimed to do was to quantify how diverse these ecological roles were by species to get an idea of which ones are going to have a bigger impact if we lose them. Okay. To try to quantify which ones are the most distinct from the groups in their ecological roles, and therefore, if they die out, will be a greater, a more notable loss. Gotcha. So which, which ones are more unique? Yes. So if we lose this species, we will lose a unique impact on an ecosystem that, that the other species aren't necessarily replicating. Precisely. They looked at them for their ecological functions and also looked at them from a phylogenetic, so their relation to the others. How distinct are they evolutionarily, right. you know, from the other groups? Who are the more distant cousins? Exactly. And they constructed a global database of all 28 species. Cool. This took in functional diversity, so their form and function, you know, their morphology, as well as distinctiveness in their group and ecosystem. These used all sorts of information, including skull shape, body size, habitat use, and they found some notable distinctions, some ways that certain ones play roles that are unique to, sometimes unique to the ecosystem they're in, because that ecosystem is different from the ones the others are in. Mm -hmm. One example was Philippine crocs are notable for feeding on apple snails, which are an invasive species in that habitat. Gotcha. You know, so others also feed on snails, but their snails are not problems. Right. So the Philippine croc is doing a role that none of the others are doing because it is directly hampering that invasive species. 
They noted things like saltwater crocodiles who travel across marine habitats to different freshwater habitats, transferring nutrients from freshwater to marine and back more than other crocs. They then combined this functional distinctiveness quotient, this this model that they had, with the threat ranking scores of the different species of how endangered are they, with the idea that if we overlap these fields of data and find the ones that are most distinct and most critically endangered, that's the croc. Those are the crocs that you should probably look at for conservation efforts more notably or with the most urgency. Right, high priority. Because they are close to going extinct, and if they go extinct, we will lose a more distinct form of croc, a more distinct role in their ecosystem. They came up with a list of 10 species that hit high on the list for their unique ecological functions. The gharial, the saltwater crocodile, broad-snouted caiman, allig- the American alligator, and Chinese alligator, freshwater crocodile, Orinoco, Cuban, Philippine, and Siamese. And of this list, depending on the exact scenario, 32 to 38% might be lost in the next 100 years based on their current situation. So a third of that list is in major danger. And they found that Asia particularly was a hot spot mm. for endangered species that are functionally distinct. So Asia is a place that we should focus more effort potentially based on these findings. And just generally... Of those 10, six are critically endangered. So overlapping this data is hopefully, the researchers are hoping, allow us to more accurately focus our conservation efforts within crocodilians. Yeah, this, this can be really useful information because when you have a situation like crocs where you've got two dozen species that all are in need of help, it can be really difficult to figure out, all right, what's step one? Where mm-hmm. do we start? Having a list that says, all right, this is an okay order to go in. Yeah. Start your efforts on these species and then move on to the others as things go on. That can be really handy for sorting out the best approaches, the most effective approaches to conservation strategies. Also, this kind of study harkens to a kind of conversation that we've had several times before on the podcast that conservation more and more is not just about conserving species, like Mm -hmm. an individual species. It is about conserving ecosystem health. Yes. Like the health and diversity of ecosystems. And crocs are a great example of animals where that is a really big deal because crocs tend to be ecosystem engineers. Yeah. So it's it's a way of saying, not that, for instance, the gharial is more important than the saltwater crocodile as a species. Mm -hmm. But for its environment, it is more unique and it is in more trouble. Right. So even if you had two equally endangered species, but one was a either shared its range with another species, so it its roles would be covered. Mm -hmm. The other one is going to be a greater loss for its ecosystem. So it's just, it's a way to quantify things, like you said, to help make those hard choices and give a order of operations, potentially. Yeah, this this helps us in solving the horrible ecological trolley problem yes. that we unfortunately face in the world that we live in. Yeah, because well, a lot of times it's, you have this many funds, you can yeah. save one species with it. Well, and they're all endangered, so yep. we, we do have to, we, we've messed things up bad enough that we got to start making choices. Yep. So sad, but encouraging. Hopefully there will be more progress in the future. Well, speaking of large aquatic critically endangered species, my news is about whales. Oh, hey. Uh, Not about modern whales, about the evolution of whales and when they developed certain interesting habits. This is research by Sarah Dungan and Belinda Chang in PNAS. And the article we will link in the blog post is an article on Science Alert by Carly Casella. Cetaceans is the group of animals that includes whales, that is whales, dolphins, porpoises, orcas, and all of them. We talked about their evolution back in episode 41. One of the interesting things about whales, cetaceans as a whole today, is that their lifestyle varies. The -hmm. way they live, how they hunt. One of the things that some whales are really good at doing is deep diving. Yeah. They will dive down really deep to 
forage for food. That's where they get their food. Sperm whales are a classic example of this, although they're not the only ones. So some whales are deep divers, others hunt in the shallows, right? Dolphins, for example, will often hunt in the shallow parts of water. Yeah, some hunt at the surface even if it's in deep water. Yes. They're hunting at the surface where things are growing with sunlight. This research was seeking to get a sense of what is the evolutionary history of deep diving as a habit in whales. How long have they been doing that? So to get at this, not uh, looking at fossils, they instead looked at a specific protein that is expressed in the eyes of whales. Uh... This is a visual pigment protein named rhodopsin which is well known for being extremely sensitive to light and useful in low light conditions. Which it would be very deep down. Absolutely. So what they did was they analyzed the genetics, the genes that code for this particular visual protein across cetaceans and cetacean cousins, and then compared those genes and came up with a genetic evolutionary history. We've talked about this in the, in the past where you can combine genetic sequences of different related organisms and come up with a probabilistic estimate of what did the evolutionary history of this genetic sequence look like as we go back in evolutionary time. As part of reconstructing the evolutionary history of this protein, they were also able to determine what the genetic sequence for this particular protein would have looked like in the ancestral whales earliest ancestors of whales at the time where they were moving from land to water. Then, and this is a super cool part, they took that predicted ancestral gene sequence and plugged it into lab-grown cells and grew that version of this protein. What? So they grew, they developed with that gene sequence, a synthetic gene sequence, a predicted ancestral version of the rhodopsin protein. What? Because we live in the future and it's great. Yeah, no, that's that feels like when <laughs> you're watching one of those old Crime of the Week shows from the 90s. Yes. They're like, did we get them on camera? We did. So, all right, can you enhance it? Yes. And then they bring up like a 3D image yeah, so of the person. Reconstruct their face. <laughs> yes. It's like, all right, so scan now and get his fingerprints. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So they reconstructed the proteins and tested how they respond to light to see what that would be like. Yeah, how likely it would be that these were decent at low light conditions. Yes. Oh. And what they found is their reconstructed ancestral version of the protein was highly sensitive to light, Mm -hmm. more so than expected, in particular very sensitive to blue light, in a way that is most similar to modern day fish that are active in the mesopelagic zone. That is fish that's, that dive deeper than 200 meters or 600 feet in the water. That is a deep diving signal yes. to these proteins. On top of that, they also noticed that their reconstructed protein responded rapidly to changes in light intensity, which is something we see today in deep diving mammals. So what's really interesting about this is not only does it seem like this ancient state of this protein would have been good for deep diving, this suggests that this goes all the way back to some of the earliest whales, that some of the very first whales that ever made it into the ocean would have been capable of deep diving, even before the divergence of our modern toothed and baleen whales. Yeah. Which, if that is an accurate assessment, would mean that all of our modern cetaceans evolved from deep diving ancestors whoa this brings up so many questions for me because like a it takes major adaptations to be able to dive deep Mm -hmm. like your lungs you know since you're an air breather since you are a mammal your lungs need to be able to carry enough air for you to go down and come back up you need to be able to swim well enough to make it down there In the amount of time you have for what your lungs can carry. You need to be able to withstand the pressure as well as sensing your way around in the dark. Absolutely. Because, you know, things like sperm whales are using echolocation once they get down to the deepest points. Mm -hmm. Their eyes are no longer the main form of navigation down there. So you're using a new sense organ that earliest whales wouldn't have had. So it brings up questions of like, how were you maintaining those things? Or did you initially develop that? low light vision for a different purpose were they nocturnal hunters or something Mm -hmm. you know i don't know how similar 
nocturnal adaptations are to deep water vision right. adaptations. And I don't know. I don't know. The 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 blue shift mm-hmm. in the light sensitivity and the changing in light intensity. Yes. Were the things that they said that that seems specifically like deep diving. Yeah, because the blue shift, blue light travels farther in water than any other color of light. Yes. So deeper down things are only blue. That's the only thing you can see. All other colors turn to black because the lights for those are no longer being transported down that deep. So that's very characteristic. And light intensity is like if you're changing. Yeah. If you're going up and down. Exactly. Then it's because you're going up and down. Light intensity doesn't change rapidly day to night. (laughs) You got hours for you to adjust. (laughs) So that's very cool. Yeah. And this is all based on uh, the genetic sequence of a protein. Yeah. Which has both sides of a that's a very cool result Mm -hmm. to be able to find uh from such specific info but on the other hand this will be it will be really good to get corroborating data from other sources of info to confirm that this is indeed the case yeah there's lots of room for error to sneak in when we're estimating a evolutionary tree based off of genes and proteins and then trying to recreate a protein if your recreation process didn't go accurately for some reason, if you made an assumption that turns out not to be true, you were, your protein is potentially bunk. So there's lots of ways that we can test this, hopefully. Yes. Cool! Well, speaking of relatives of mammals, that swam. Sure. Yeah, this one is a mammalian ancestor, or at least cousins of ancestors, that was aquatic they've compared it very much to a hippo but it was not at all shaped like a hippo all right this is a weird animal this is researched by ralph wernerberg et al in paleo vertebrata and the article is by jamie carter in live science so this is a new species and genus of a group called the caseids and this is a fossil. This is a fossil. We are finally talking about yes, fossils on this, this is true. Paleontology podcast. We are podcast. finally talking about fossils. <laughs> this is an extinct group, a fossil group that was one of those early reptilian groups that had very mammalian-like traits that are often thought to be ancestral to or close to ancestral to mammals, mm-hmm. you know, linked to the origins of what would eventually lead to mammals. Right. We talked about these a bunch in episode 47, the early synapses, yes. sometimes proto-mammals. Yes. This was around those groups. Uh, I don't know how close, because the articles didn't talk about its exact relation to mammals, but the caseids specifically were a mainly herbivorous group, potentially some of the earliest land herbivores. In, in Earth's history, they are characteristic for having barrel-shaped bodies, these broad-chested bodies and small little heads with a, room for large digestive tracts to break down plants. So characteristic body shape for an herbivore. Up until now, there have only been about not quite 20 species found for this group, identified for this group, most from the United States and Russia, with some more recently found from Europe. This new species is from France. This new specimen is now named Lalido rhynchus gandai, which comes from the Permian, so just before the Triassic. This is aged about 265 million years old, and it's represented by partial skeleton, but well-preserved postcranial. So the body includes a femur, shoulder blade, I think some ribs were also included. There's a picture that has some of the, in uh, one of the articles, the f- bones are not small. The femur is 14 inches long, Whew. Uh, so 35 centimeters, and the shoulder blade was 20 inches long, 50 centimeters. Wow, so big animal. This is a big animal. They said it would have looked like a rotund lizard with a very small head. Sure. Uh, so they had a very reptilian body shape. It would have had long tail, squat limbs probably, uh, small head, like would have looked lizard-ish, mm-hmm. but were not lizards. This would have been about a three and a half meter long animal in Oof. total. That's a 10, 12 foot long animal. Yep. They gave 12 foot in, uh, I think the news article summed it up as 12 foot. This is a cool find for a number of reasons. One, it took them about 20 years from finding the specimen to this publication because it was encased in extremely hard sandstone mm. and took some major effort getting it out. It was a long preparation process for this specimen. That'll happen. Analysis of the specimen. 
as well as the locality it was found in, the evidence from the sediment suggests an aquatic environment, which has already been hypothesized for other large forms of caseids. And the structure of this one's bones seem to suggest that. Now, the structure may not be what you expect, because this f- structure is spongy and flexible, hmm. which is the inverse of what you typically hear about for aquatic animals like manatees and hippos. Right. Denser bones. Yeah, dense and solid. Like a, it, They look like a rock when you break those bones open, because it's just solid all the way through. It's, and it feels like yeah. you hold a manatee rib, and you're like, oh, man. That's a lot of bones. I could break a door with this. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I could bash open my competitor. <laughs> but for... Some extinct amphibians and marine reptiles, this spongy, flexible texture is characteristic. Okay. So for other groups, this is very characteristic of a semi-aquatic lifestyle. Uh, Now, a lot of the articles and uh, news pieces will have a line comparing it to hippo Mm -hmm. because they've got a very rotund body with short little limbs. Right. But they said it probably did not move around like a hippo. Who cannot swim but trot across the bottom. Right. Dense bones. Uh, El Gandhi here was likely a swimmer. Probably able to swim decently well. Oh, cool. Or at least better than a hippo. Right. <laughs> uh, it would have been a very heavy animal weighing hundreds of pounds. Which could also be beneficial being semi-aquatic to support that weight in the water. Mm-hmm. You know, floating around more easily. Not that it couldn't have moved on land, potentially. They even compare it to the hippo lifestyle of being a browsing semi-aquatic animal, that it was a plant eater, so it may have been coming up on land to eat even, like hippos do, but it was eating plants, but swimming, which we don't see that combination with a ton of groups. And they said, if that is the case, then this this species invented that niche, and then hippos recreated it later. Yes. (laughs) They also did a phylogenetic analysis on the species, and looked at where its position within the overall group of caseids seems to be. It first places not with other French caseids, but closer with North American oh. species. So it places a little bit differently than you might, they might have expected. And it is one of the youngest caseids. So it is one of the most recent and could therefore be a quote unquote more advanced, more derived, have more... Right. Evolved it, it features has diverged from yes. its relatives more over time, so it may have more distinct features from earlier caseids, which could potentially give us major understandings for mammalian evolution. Yeah, with that ancestral connection, it's so cool to find a species where it's this is in a location we wouldn't expect for this animal in terms of its relationships to its relatives. It's at a different time than the others. It's the youngest, and it's doing a different lifestyle. Yeah. Uh, just, this is just the weirdo of this group of already weird animals. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I also love that at basically any time throughout the last 200 million years, even more, 250 million years, you go to a body of water and there are just big land animals yeah. splashing around in yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. That's just a thing that we've always been doing. That's, well, there's just many, many groups of life have looked at a body of water and go, you know, it would re- be really nice to just float. Yeah. To just what if I was in there all the let's time? Let's just wait around in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's cool. It's refreshing. Well, speaking of big animals and getting around, and uh, are they or are they not spending all their time in the water? <laughs> uh, I got news about sauropods. Oh, hey, the big dinosaurs, specifically a study about how sauropod feet were able to support their preposterously large bodies. Which is a very good question. It is a very good question. This is research by Andreas Janel et al. in Science Advances, and we will link in the blog post to an article in Popular Science by Jocelyn Solis Marrera. Sauropods are dinosaurs, episode 101. They are famous for having very long necks, very long tails, and being just scale-destroyingly large. Just, just huge. The biggest sauropods, I mean, heck, the medium-sized sauropods are larger than any other land animals outside their group, and the biggest sauropods outweigh the next largest groups by just many times. (laughs) Enormous, preposterous, tens, dozens of tons. So there has been lots of discussion about what adaptations allowed sauropods to be that big. This study is looking at feet. How did sauropod feet support their giant weight? 
Uh, a lot of animals that are very big have adaptations to their legs and feet to help to not, you know, buckle underneath them. Dinosaurs are interesting because they tend to be digitigrade, which means they walk on their fingers, not on their tiptoes. That's unguligrade. But if you look at a cat or a dog, they're walking on their fingers with their heel and their wrist lifted up off the ground. Yeah, very little of the foot actually on the ground. Yes, birds are like this as well. As opposed to us humans and bears, where the heel of the foot touches the ground. The whole foot all the way back to the heel. That is plantigrade. That, that's why us and bears only have one quote-unquote knee. And right. <laughs> things like dogs and cats on their back legs have those two knee. The second knee, the bottom one, is the heel. Yes. Now, being digitigrade, walking on the fingers and weighing 10, 20, 30, 50, 80 tons, seems like it shouldn't work. Number one, because that you that's a that's a very unstable position, it sure seems like, if your legs are pillars. Yep. But also because sauropod footprints seem to show a full foot. Mm -hmm. Like it's not just the to the fingers and the toes that are touching the ground. So there have been two main hypotheses to explain this. One, perhaps they evolved to be plantigrade, to put the heel all the way down, or Perhaps they still held the heel up, but had a pad of soft tissue underneath the heel. Mm -hmm. Elephants have this, yes. very famously. If you look at an x-ray of an elephant's foot, their feet, their, their, their heel is up off the ground, but they've got this big cushion underneath the heel that serves as a shock absorber. So when they step, it's absorbing some of that impact and also helps distribute weight so that it's not just on the bones. Heel pads are actually very common. Elephants have them. Rhinos, camels, horses, lots of big animals have some version of this heel pad. Yeah. It's it's nature's shoes. It's putting yeah. cushioning and, and support yeah. under the bones of your feet. But that doesn't fossilize. That's soft tissue. So here, what they did was they went to 3D biomechanical models. Cool. They created 3D models of the feet of several different species of sauropods and then basically ran tests to see how well does this foot withstand the stress of being underneath this giant body in different postures. They tested the model with elephant feet to make sure that it would work and then they tested on a variety of sauropods. What they found was, according to their model, every foot posture they tested would result in the tissues and bones of the foot being overstressed. Like it could not support the weight of the body, except if there was a soft pad underneath the heel. Okay. That it didn't work if they were flat-footed. It, it didn't work if they didn't have a pad. According to this model, they must have had a pad, otherwise their feet would have broken. Yeah, the math only checks out if there's a pad. Yes. Cool. Uh, which, super cool support for the idea that sauropods had this feature that we see in a lot of mammals. Also, the model looked at early sauropod, uh, sauropod ancestors. Uh, they specifically looked at Platyosaurus, which was big. That's a big animal, elephant-sized at least, but not quite sauropod sauropod. And their model even predicted that there needed to have been some degree of heel pad that early on, which is consistent with trackways that might suggest some sort of heel pad in Platyosaurus. So this model also predicts the evolutionary sequence that you could have started in these Triassic forms with this early, what they called an incipient heel pad, <laughs> that as sauropods grew to their preposterous large sizes, evolved to this full supporting the whole foot large pad. Cool. And that this was likely a key innovation that allowed them to become gigantic. One of the many innovations that allowed sauropods to get to their sizes. That's very cool. This is one of those findings where it it's not at all surprising. No. Like our biggest animals today need those foot pads to not break their feet. That so it makes sense that if you get bigger than that, probably also would have wanted some padding. Yeah. So it makes perfect sense. But any step in our understanding of how animals that big functioned at that size is exciting. Yes. There's also the note across this article and the paper and another article that I read that there are 
obvious future expansions for this. So one, in the article, there was another researcher who was quoted as saying they tested their model against elephants, but sauropod and elephant feet are very different. Mm -hmm. So they should also test their model to see if it changes at all if they look at rhinos or camels, just to give it more robust support. Yes. But also... I would be fascinated to see this done on other dinosaurs. I was having the exact same thought. Because, yeah, Triceratops is not sauropod-sized, but that's still several tons. That's still an elephant-sized animal. Yeah, and if elephants need it... Absolutely. It would make sense that the largest ceratopsians... Ceratopsians, stegosaurs, and ankyl- Basically, any dinosaur... If rhinos and camels have these... Yep. Can we find evidence for these across... The whole dinosaur family tree. And if we don't find, like if if T-Rex, which was bigger than a lot of the animals you just mentioned, Mm -hmm. if they don't have pads, what's different about their feet or the way they're carrying their weight? Yes. Like, why don't you need pads? Very cool. Yeah, cool stuff. Well, hey, now that the news has meandered its way over into dinosaur territory... Perfect. What a great segue to get into our main topic of the episode. After the break, we're going to talk about the Jurassic Cretaceous Transition, a very unusual, mysterious, and exciting slice of Earth history. (gasps) Music. This episode, we are discussing the Jurassic Cretaceous transition, the boundary between the Jurassic period and the Cretaceous period. This boundary, this transition, this border is a very interesting one. But before we can get into what's interesting about it, let's zoom out and talk about the geologic time scale and where we get these time periods. Yeah. We're going to go into some science, or a little bit of a science lesson today, uh, which I'm excited to do. Well, because we mentioned the boundaries, you know, the the Triassic, the Jurassic, the Cretaceous, and they ha- there has to be a beginning and end oh, yeah. somewhere in there. But we don't often get to mention, how. what does that mean? How did we distinguish that? What is that boundary? Yes. Often when we talk about boundaries, we talk about them in reference to, right, a mass extinction happened at the, be- the boundary between these periods, Bunch or... Of- Bad stuff happened Bad right stuff here. happened here. Or there was an asteroid impact, or there was the Ice Age started. Or We're talking about in reference. And we've had multiple episodes of this podcast dedicated to boundaries between time periods. Yep. So let's, let's zoom out a little bit so that we can talk about why this particular boundary uh, gets its own episode, even though it's not quite like the others. <laughs> uh, geologic time periods were started long, long ago by scientists who would look through the geologic column and go, there are distinct chunks where where things are different, Yeah, right? The Jurassic period was designated as different from the Cretaceous period because there's different things going on. And it's convenient for us humans to break things into boxes. Yeah. It's so our that favorite we, thing to do. <laughs> we sure love doing it. So yeah, the Jurassic period, the middle of the Mesozoic era, right? The Mesozoic era, the age of reptiles is split into three chunks that almost any geologist or nine-year-old could recite for you. The Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. The Jurassic is in the middle. You got your stegosaurs and your brachiosaurs, lots of diverse ichthyosaurs, things like that. And then when you go to the Cretaceous, there is a switch of some of the dinosaurs, you get a lot of birds, you get horned dinosaurs and armored dinosaurs and tyrannosaurs, uh, flowering plants diversify. So these are the two periods we're looking at, and these have been recognized for a long, long time. Yes. Scientists said these are different sections of the time scale. We find it useful to differentiate between these, based usually on life, based on plants and animals and things like that. But if, as you said, if we're splitting things into time periods, we eventually have to decide where is the line. Yeah, which which is always the the fundamental issue of our human need to put things in boxes. Yes. Is that those boxes don't actually exist. Right. So we just kind of have to decide, well, right here yes. is where you go in that box and you go in that box. It's arbitrary. Yes. A little bit, but still useful. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, where where is the northern border of the United States? Well, it's wherever we decide to put it. 
but we have to all this. But agree. we all agree. And once we put it there, now it's useful. <laughs> yep. It's like the rules of a kid's game. Absolutely. It's, you've made them all up, but as long as you all agree, then they work. Yes. Right. Country and state borders are made up. You know, like money and laws. <laughs> When it goes. we do not endorse anarchy that is attributed to us so if That's you correct. do it do it on your own That's somebody else's anarchy <laughs> geologic boundaries are often a place the reason the geologic time periods are often different is because something important happened at the boundary so it's not uncommon for boundaries to have some sort of dramatic event and this brings me to the first reason why the jurassic cretaceous boundary is a bit unusual it is the only period boundary in the Mesozoic era that doesn't feature one of the big five mass extinctions. Oh, good point. We've talked about these in the past. They are, there's tons of mass extinctions in history, but there are the big five. At the start of the Triassic is the Permian extinction, episode 45. At the end of the Triassic, the Triassic mass extinction, episode 15. And at the end of the Cretaceous is the KPG, the Age of Dinosaurs ending extinction event. The Jurassic Cretaceous boundary is the only one without a big five mass extinction. Was there a mass extinction? Stay tuned. I forgot that the others were all part of the big five. Yes. Yeah, that's a good the Mesozo- point. Yeah, there was a lot of, it was a rough time. The Mesozoic. <laughs> Eventful. <laughs> this can make those boundaries relatively easy to spot because there's a major shift at that time period. The end Cretaceous is great. There is a literal line of asteroid dust <laughs> that you can find in geologic sections all over the world. And you point and you go, there it is. That's the end of the Cretaceous period. <laughs> that it was the end. <laughs> big T, big E. <laughs> so some geologic boundaries have a thing that happened, but there's always a shift. There's always a change that we can identify to help us draw that line. During the Phanerozoic Eon, the last 550 million years or so, there is a whole list of geologic periods, right? There's eras and periods and epochs and ages and how we break them into lots of different divisions. Yeah, you get, there's each of the big periods in the Mesozoic have smaller time frames within them that you will hear researchers use when they're talking about specific times. But we're talking about periods today in the Phanerozoic. Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, Paleogene, Neogene, Quaternary. Each one of those we have designated a boundary. And the way we designate the boundary is with something called a global boundary stratotype section and point. And all that means is that there is an official thing to look for. Yes. Sometimes, like at the end Cretaceous, it is a chemical signature. Once you see this line, this chemical shift, something like that, maybe it's an indication of a climate shift, like the beginning of a glaciation, a chemical marker that when you're going through your geologic record, when you see that marker, that's it. That's the boundary between these periods. Oftentimes it is a fossil. Yes. It is the first, sometimes it's the first appearance or the last appearance of a particular species that we've designated because... Usually you find one that's very common, Mm -hmm. very widespread, very fossiliferous, very commonly fossilized, so that you can say, yeah, when you see the first representative of this group, you are officially at the boundary. That is the start of the next period. Yeah. Not all of these are the best. Like we refine and sometimes we'll change them over time to kind of improve them. Uh, And when we shift them, that can adjust where the boundary is a little bit. But the general idea is, this is the thing to look for that tells you that's where the boundary is. And I know some will have multiple things where it's like these three species or these species and this sediment feature. Yes, the Cretaceous is one of those. Yep. Where you've got the asteroid impact, but there's also fossil indicators. Exactly. So Uh, Typically the disappearance of fossil indicators (laughs) because they're... A lot of death happened during that time. (laughs) I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know what the markers are for the late Cretaceous. Because sometimes it's first appearance and sometimes it's last appearance for fossils. I assume it's a last appearance for the Cretaceous. Oh, yeah. But I could be wrong. Well, and I've also heard people, you know, warn or caution on like, we need, you need to be aware of when you use indicator species Mm -hmm. to distinguish a time period. Because what if we find out that that indicator species lasted a bit longer than we thought it did? Well, does that now mean that that period lasted longer or is the period still where it was? And now that indicator species should not be used. Right. So 
that's part of that adjustment is we're constantly trying to are are our test methods still reliable as science changes yes and this brings me to the second reason why the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary is an unusual and interesting boundary that gets its own episode. Weird. As I mentioned, all those periods that I just Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, etc., etc., the boundaries between at the beginning of every one of those periods has an officially agreed upon this is the marker that tells you where the boundary is, except for the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. As of this recording, there is not an officially designated global indicator for where the Jurassic Cretaceous border is in the geologic record. Yeah, that is weird. Isn't that weird? <laughs> it would be an exaggeration to say that this means we don't know when the Jurassic ends. Because it'd be an exaggeration, number one, because the Jurassic is made up. Yes. Right, we, we set that label. It's not That's not really a real thing. But also, because we generally know where it is. Yes. Right? You'll often hear it, it's 145 million years ago, we have a sense of what makes the Jurassic and the Cretaceous different. So, like, it's not like we have no idea. It's not that that border just doesn't exist. Right. There is something there that distinguishes this time period from this time period. But a little bit, we don't know where the boundary is. Mm -hmm. And there's reasons for this. There are reasons. So one reason is that when you look at the fossil record around that time period, the fossil sites that we have exhibit a lot of endemism, which is to say that the fossil species you find at a fossil site is mainly going to be only found at that fossil site. Yeah. Typically, when you want an indicator, you want something that is found at many, many different places all around the world. That's why ocean fossils are really, really good index fossils for yes. this. At the end of the Jurassic, there's a lot of regionality. There's a lot of uniqueness to the various geologic sites we have for those which makes it very difficult to compare and contrast across the different sites yeah because yeah you you don't have a uniformity yes well there isn't a global signature mm -hmm. in the fossils now you might be wondering dear listeners why is that stay tuned <laughs> and then the other reason why it is difficult to identify exactly where that layer is is because as i mentioned before there wasn't a big major Cat catastrophic event that happened at this boundary. There wasn't an asteroid the size of Mount Everest that left a mark everywhere on the planet. There wasn't the Permian extinction. <laughs> it Stuff happened at the boundary. We're going to talk about what actually happened across this transition, but there wasn't a thing, capital T. So we don't actually have enough recognized evidence in the fossil record to point when you're looking around the world at the geologic record and say that is where the boundary is. It's blurry. Yeah, well, because you can have massive global change without a dramatic event. Yes. Like, things can change, but slower or more gradually or more subtly, but there is a distinct things are different here from here on the timeline, but there's not a junk that right. forced that change. It happened for some other reason. Now, at this point, astute listeners might be wondering, well, hey, wait a second. If we don't have a designated spot in the record where Jurassic becomes Cretaceous, you just said, David, me, uh, that the Jurassic ends at around 145 million years ago. Wouldn't we not be able to date the boundary precisely if we don't have a boundary? Hey, yeah. And the answer is, yeah, a little. <laughs> I have come across at least one recent paper that argued for changing the date of the boundary. And eventually, when we do, I finally identify, all right, we found it. There, there's some studies in the works, I believe, looking at microfossils. Yeah. Like nanoplankton and things like that to try to find something that is universal enough, that is found widely at a number of different sites around the world. Can act as that indicator. That can act as the indicator. And once we find that, then perhaps we'll be able to get some dates off of some nearby materials and when we do, I mean, the, the one paper that I read, which was trying to identify the boundary at a specific fossil site, dated their their candidate for the boundary was 140 million. Okay. Which is a few million less than the commonly cited number. Yeah. So yeah, once we find an indicator, that may very well shift the the official age for where Jurassic becomes Cretaceous. Well, I feel like it's 
kind of how it, it's what happens with a lot of times with with groups or species it's where it's like when did this one show up it's like well based off the fossils based off of our estimations for its evolutionary history based off of its relatives somewhere in this time gap you mm-hmm. know somewhere between this million and this million years and a lot of times in discussion it will be common to pick kind of a middle point in there and be like all right this is roughly right. what we're aiming it's within this range but right the middle point of that is this many years because it's arbitrary because it's arbitrary <laughs> we don't know we don't have the we don't have that first fossil to be able to say for sure and so we're we're going to we're giving the best answer we can right well and it's also a gradual shift it's a gradual shift there is no distinct distinct we just pick a time yep and it's like in this case it's like in in the here in the united states oftentimes the borders between states will be along a river yes for example because if you're gonna pick something arbitrary you can at least pick something that everybody can agree on and measure together yeah we can all agree that the river's right here that's the river and that side is different (laughs) than this side that's what we're doing here we're trying to find a marker so we can say oh okay that is about where we want this boundary to be Let's date that, and that will be the official line. See, now I'm trying to find a, an a aspect for the metaphor of when rivers shift and change their shape. I was just thinking, yeah, <laughs> we're losing Missouri. <laughs> and all of this uh, uncertainty brings me back around to a question that I asked at the top of our discussion. Was there an extinction, a mass extinction, at the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary? This has been a hazy question because of all the things I just discussed historically so in when people were in the past identifying signatures of mass extinctions geologists have for a long time geologists paleontologists have noted that around this transition there is a significant shift in marine ecosystems and terrestrial ecosystems Mm -hmm. we've even hinted at some of these on the podcast before so for example in dinosaurs at the end of the as we move from jurassic into cretaceous we see extinctions declines in stegosaurs and brachiosaurs in the smaller pterosaurs Mm -hmm. lots of groups of ocean animals invertebrates and vertebrates show declines or changes as you move from jurassic to cretaceous and then there's a bunch of stuff that shows up in the cretaceous afterwards which are all the things that you might expect to see when you're looking at a mass extinction and indeed there at one point and indeed, there have been paleontologists who have labeled this. This is There is a mass extinction at this boundary. It's not a big five mass extinction. It's not Cretaceous and Triassic, but it's a mass extinction worthy of our note. Yeah, it walks and quacks like a mass extinction. However, the more studies we do on this time period, the more it becomes evident that things are complicated. <laughs> For example, I'll use one specific example that will make Will very happy. Back in 2016, the headlines were excited because paleontologists identified a new species named Machimosaurus rex. Oh, yeah. This was a marine croc. Yep, yep, yep. This belonged to a group called Teleosaurs. It came from Tunisia. And the reason it made headlines is because it was the biggest teleosaur ever found. It was, I think they said 10 meters was was the estimate. So that's that's an orca-sized marine croc. That's huge. But the reason the finding was really significant, separate from just being a giant marine croc and very cool, is because this group of marine crocs were thought to have gone extinct at the end of the Jurassic. Mm -hmm. But this new species came from the early Cretaceous. It extended the lifespan of this group of animals. When the paper came out, the authors pointed out that one reason for this discrepancy might be that most of the fossil sites we have from this time period, late Jurassic into early Cretaceous, are from the northern continents. Oh, okay. This is an African find, and since we have fewer fossil sites from that, the southern continents, it may have masked the fact that these animals persisted into the early Cretaceous. Mm-hmm. Maybe they're were declines that were different in different parts of the world and were only mostly seeing one part of the world. Similar things have been found from other studies. Another couple examples, there was a study in 2012 that examined the history of ichthyosaurs, so the the fish lizards, we talked about them in episode 116, 
which had also been proposed to have had a mass extinction. Ichthyosaurs themselves had experienced an extinction event at the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. That study reviewed the fossil record, added some new species, collected all the data, examined it, and found no evidence of a mass extinction. Hmm. More data, once again, suggested no. There was another study from 2010 that did a very similar thing with invertebrates. They looked at ammonites and bivalves at a specific site. And they said, if you look at lots of sites, you, you people have pointed at this extinction signal. But when we looked at this one site by itself, we don't see an extinction signal. And in fact, that, pap- that report, uh, I think it was in the title, they called it the myth of the Jurassic Cretaceous extinction. Yeah, yeah. That they're... That when we look closer and when we find more data, it seems to become more complicated. Yeah, the idea that, n- you're not actually at a glance, but when you l- just look over the total body of data, it seems to tell one story. But when people have zoomed in on more specific aspects of that data, specific groups or specific sites, it doesn't seem to line up with the same story. Right. And this brings up a subject that we've touched on on the podcast before that is very interesting, which is... What are the troubles with identifying a mass extinction in the fossil record? Yeah. Uh, And we've talked about some of these. We might have talked about this a bit in episode 137 when we talked about fossilization and the biases in the fossil record. For example, it is always very unlikely that the last fossil you find of any group of animals is the last member of that species. Yeah, the endling of that species. So if you have a limited sample, especially if they were experiencing gradual population declines. The smaller the population's got, the less likely they are to be fossilized in the first place. So if you've got a small fossil record sample anyway, that can make it more likely that you're going to miss the gradual nature of that decline, and it'll look like they go extinct more abruptly. Yeah, you won't see it peter off. You'll just see an end. Another thing that can happen, and this came up a lot in my readings about this particular boundary, is that if your data is mostly coming from certain places, that can skew what the data is telling you. We, I mean, and that's never happened. We're just taking a perspective from one part of the world skews what you think is happening in the rest of the world. Right. Like that's that, that, Thankfully, we've moved past yes, that. Yes, that our... just doesn't happen anymore. Uh, so <laughs> in the case of this boundary of time, as I mentioned with the teleosaur, Most of our fossil sites come from northern continents. And not only that, a lot of what we know about this time period comes from Lagerstaden. Exceptionally well-preserved fossil sites. So if you looked, for example, at a list, and I'm going to, you know, slightly make up a scenario to illustrate the point. But if you looked at a list of all of the species we know of from the fossil record around this time... A huge chunk of that list is going to be coming from a handful of fossil sites. Yes. Because here's a few fossil sites that preserve hundreds of specimens, really well-preserved specimens, maybe soft tissue. You're getting these really exceptional sites. So you might have dozens of other sites that each only have a handful of fossil species. So if something happened at those particular well-preserved sites and then you're only looking at the numbers on the whole, it will look like something happened, but really something only happened in those places with a lot of fossils. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, you're getting a lot of data, but your data is from a few very particular sources. Yes. So it's not guaranteed that that is going to give you incorrect information, but there is a higher chance that you could be, your data could be skewed or it could be biased for some aspect of those very particular sites. Yes, if you run a poll on public opinion about something, and you sample a thousand people from three places, and then ten people from a hundred other places, most of what your results are is what those people in those three places think. Yeah, and it could end up that if you do a better poll following that up, and poll everyone evenly, that you get the same results. Like, mm-hmm. And those three places might have been an accurate representation of the whole area. But you've increased your chances of a biased study by not having an even sourcing of data. And we can't help that with fossils. Yes, that's what I was just <laughs> going to say. If you poll in unevenly like that, that's probably your fault. Yeah, you're doing you're a, a not bad good... pollster. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in the fossil record, we don't get to choose. So it just the shape of the fossil record from this time period 
has inherent biases, inherent instabilities that we kind of have to navigate around. Yeah, we have to figure out workarounds. So the question of, is there a mass extinction at the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary seems less and less clear the more data we get. But it is clear that something happened. There is a shift as we move from Jurassic to Cretaceous. There is a reason that early geologists correctly identified that this was a good division. They are, they are distinct chunks of time. So there has been a lot of research trying to sort out what exactly went on. What were these changes? If not, maybe, maybe not a mass extinction. What happens? So after the break, we're going to go through and talk about what are the various things that seem to have been happening with life on Earth at the late Jurassic into the early Cretaceous. So before the break, I talked about how the signal of extinction at the end Jurassic, the beginning of the Cretaceous, is hazy. Despite that, there are extinctions that we see at this time. But the complexity is that as we look, and again, at the border, there's not, there's less evidence than we'd like. If we start at the late Jurassic, 160, 150 million years ago or so, and we move across into the early Cretaceous, 140, 130, what we see is a mixture of extinctions, turnovers, turnovers meaning uh, some things are disappearing, but being replaced, right? Yes. The, 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 the ecological balance is shifting and radiations yeah diversifications so we've got old things dwindling new things on the rise and other things just swapping places that is kind of the mixture of signals from life from the fossil record at this transitional time here are some examples of things that we see let's go down the list we haven't done one of these in a while since we stopped our extinction episode trend uh, tradition yeah dinosaurs we see declines, losses in many groups of dinosaurs, uh, including big theropods, the big meat eaters, sauropods like Brachiosaurs and Diplodocus, Diplodocus and its cousins, Stegosaurs. We absolutely see some declines. On the other hand, we see rises as we move into the early Cretaceous in other dinosaur groups. Uh, Iguanodontians, the Iguanodon cousins, are on the rise Ankylosaurs, the armored dinosaurs from episode 69, are on the rise, uh, possibly because stegosaurs were in decline. They mm -hmm. might have been ecologically replacing them. And uh, on the, among dinosaurs, the most significant thing that happens in the early Cretaceous is the rise of birds. Yeah. We see this massive diversification of birds as well as cousins of birds. And this is another place where it's good to make a little note that a lot of that information comes from a handful of fossil sites that are really <laughs> well preserved. A lot of this info of how life was shifting at that time came from a particular paper. This, I think, was a 2017 review by Tennant et al. And they made that note. They made those notes throughout the paper of th this is kind of where the imbalance in the fossil record is here. Well, it's, you'll see stuff like that in research where, like, you'll hear all these references. But then when you actually go looking, you realize that, like, most of the commonly cited fun facts and statements come from like one paper Yes, that was written, you know, oftentimes at this point, like 40, 50 years ago to a point where it doesn't mean that that's wrong, but we're putting a lot of weight on our understanding on one pillar or a few pillars, mm -hmm. which is less stable than if we have a whole bunch of pillars. <laughs> right. And that happened when I was putting together these notes that a lot of the recent papers on, especially the reviews of this transition, are from the same group of authors. Yes. Uh, which, again, doesn't mean they're wrong, but no. it does mean that it, you know. But a, if there's a biasy in that group, mm -hmm. then that means that biasy may be running through all that research. So dinosaurs at this transitional period, we see some declining, some then on the rise. Similar things in other reptiles. At this transition, we see a broad extinction of early pterosaurs, the flying reptiles. We talked about this in episode 79. There were two main groups of pterosaurs, the small-bodied ones with the long tails and the big-bodied ones with the short tails, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. The small ones dwindle and ultimately disappear around this time. 
Which is a bummer, because I, I like the long-tailed, tiny pterosaurs. Yes. <laughs> Similarly, we see extinctions in marine crocs. Oh. Uh, even though maybe not as, as abrupt a boundary as it originally seemed, there are definitely declines in marine crocs. But we also, around this time period, see the radiation, the early on the rise, the opposite of a decline, an incline, in Yusukians. Yes. The group that include, well, go on to include modern crocs. Turtles and plesiosaurs, both groups see extinctions and new forms within the same groups. So the group itself, like the, on the whole, like turtles go through the boundary. But we're seeing turnover. There's yeah. some replacement of which turtles are where ecologically. Yeah, groups of turtles didn't make it while other groups diversified. Yes. That, that's, a, that's a cool note where it's like if you counted turtles before and you count turtles after, you might get similar numbers. But which turtles made those numbers up is different. Yes, which is another one of those things that complicates this bound this transition. Cool. Uh, similar signals. Rhynchocephalians, the group that today is Tuatara's. See major extinctions, but also major radiations in lizards. Some fishes see declines, but then we see the radiations of uh, modern shark lineages. Oh. There are some declines in marine invertebrates, like ammonites and gastropods, but then major radiations around this time in uh, certain groups of beetles and flies on land. There's also a reef turnover. Oh. So in the Jurassic... It was very common for reefs to be built by rudest mollusks. Yeah. And moving into the Cretaceous, we see a shift towards scleractinian corals, stony corals. Yes. I forgot that's when that happened. It's been yep. a long time since that episode. Episode 36. <laughs> that's, a bu- that's a bunch of episodes ago. <laughs> yeah. It's been, it's been a few years. There's also a plankton turnover. So we see a shift again. It's not that reefs disappeared necessarily or plankton disappeared, but what was comprising those portions of the habitat has changed <laughs> it's just someone from like hopping time skipping from the jurassic to the cretaceous you're like yeah there's a reef right here where i let wait a second hang on this is <laughs> this is built of new stuff uh and then there's plants uh plants from what i've read seem to do okay through this boundary all right but then in the early cretaceous angiosperms flowering plants have their big explosion episode I... 57 we talked about that So there's this mixture of we've got extinctions, we've got radiations, we've got turnovers. So you can start to see why there's been debate about is there a mass extinction as we typically think of it, as opposed to just a shifting of the ecological scales. And there are some patterns we see that, uh, well, some of them clarify and some of them make it more complicated. (laughs) But there are some patterns we've noticed. Uh, for one, one of the things that makes this more complicated is that many of these changes aren't abrupt. Mm-hmm. They are gradual. We're not seeing change. This isn't like mass extinction events where it's within a million years or a couple million years. This is over tens of millions of years. We're seeing this significant level of changes but relatively drawn out. Yeah, they're not all happening at the same time. They're not all happening at the same speed. Yes. Although some of them seem to peak at the boundary. Okay. So there are certain declines, certain extinctions that do seem to maybe be more pronounced at the boundary as part of this gradual transition. There's also, when we're looking at the extinctions, larger animals tend to suffer more, which is absolutely what we see during extinction events. Uh, That we've talked about, I think every time we've ever talked about extinctions, we've mentioned that trend. Yep, yep. The bigger you are, the more resources you need. It was one of the the key features we talked about in the gigantism and dwarfism episode that that is one of the big downsides to getting big. Extinctions are going to typically hit you harder. Yes, it's one of the reasons why, and we talked about this a couple times in the past, most large animals in the world today are endangered. Yep. Because if you're in an unstable world, which we are... The bigger you are, the more resources you need, the harder time you're going to have. So we do see differentiation in what groups, right? Big versus small dinosaurs, especially Uh, the big dinosaurs seem to struggle here. We also see habitat differences. So in some cases, shallow marine environments seem to have a harder time than uh, open marine environments, Mm. like coastal environments, 
Uh, I saw one reference that suggested Freshwater might have had a harder time uh, at this time period. Because of all the littering? That, Probably, yeah. yeah. Just... All that dinosaur litter. <laughs> Another thing that's really interesting that uh, some of the papers I read pointed out is that we are not, when we see changes, turnover, right? Something is disappearing, something else is replacing it. It isn't just, as they put it, a taxonomic turnover. So taxonomic turnover, you might think of as this species was here, living like this, it disappeared and a new species came. So like we mentioned stegosaurs and ankylosaurs. It has been suggested that stegosaurs were living a certain way when they dwindled, ankylosaurs arose, right, right, diversified, and filled in that same basic ecological niche. Yes. But the changes at this time period also include ecological turnovers. That the new things are not necessarily doing the same thing that the old things were doing. For example, in insects, around this time, we see a rise in leaf eaters and parasites. Huh. Such that the insects we have after this transition are not doing quite the same things as all of the insects were doing beforehand. Uh, Another thing that uh, was noted in, I think, the big review paper is rhynchocephalians, so the not lizards, but close to lizards. The big losses that happened among rhynchocephalians have been noted in the ones that ate fish and mollusks. So a specific ecology, a specific lifestyle of these animals struggled. Uh, It's also been noted that around this time we see certain new adaptations in mammals. Uh, adaptations to the dentition, to the way they might have been eating. So there's some indication that not just who was in the ecosystem was changing, but what the roles were in the ecosystems. The the ecology doesn't work quite the same way on opposite sides of this period boundary. Huh. Intriguing. Yeah, it's it's... This is an interesting discussion because... I've heard people say this with other concepts like mass extinction of like, but aren't things going extinct all the time? Like, Mm -hmm. like if, you know, tigers go extinct today, is it a mass extinction? You know, like what, how do you distinguish between? And I like that this is also looking at like, there's different ways that things can come and go. It doesn't always have to just be something went extinct and then eventually something filled its place. Sometimes it kind of happens hand in hand Mm -hmm. where you get a turnover and sometimes it doesn't happen where this group experiences just the ones doing this thing. Right. The ones living this way, the lo- ones living here. So you can get very extremely different scenarios with how you can experience extinctions. Yeah. So we're seeing this mixture. We've got it declines. And I've seen uh, some of the papers I read said certain groups decline at levels we would expect in a mass extinction. Right. Like true major declines but not all the groups are doing that there's a lot of unevenness there's a lot of turnover it seems like a time period of dramatic ecological change that is more complicated than just saying a mass extinction it's an interesting concept that like if you you know if you were to ask if you were to study a specific group they might say, yeah, no, it was a mass extinction, all right. Absolutely. <laughs> we barely made it through that. Yes, certain groups of dinosaurs. Well, mm-hmm. yo, no, no, that. Well, and, and what that means then, because of all this change, is that it has a similar effect to a mass extinction, where afterwards things are different. Yes. Right. If you were really excited about allosaurs and brachiosaurs and stegosaurs, that's not what's around anymore after this transition. Yeah, those very distinct forms of life are now gone. Right. So even if you still have predators and armored herbivores and big dinosaurs, they're not the same ones. And the radiation of new groups of lizards, new groups of sharks, new groups of insects, new groups of plants means that the shape of the world, after we often talk about in mass extinction episodes about this set, this laid the groundwork, like this transition formed the modern world as we know it. Because if it weren't for this, this mass extinction this event, ha- this, this transition had a similar effect. Mm-hmm. The world afterwards was dramatically different. Hence, Cretaceous instead of Jurassic. Yeah. Now, as usual, with when there is a major shift, a major event, a major transition, the obvious follow-up question is, well, why? Yeah, what caused that? What happened? What was going on at this time? 
And as usual, there are a number of candidates that have been pointed at. <laughs> because the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous was a dynamic time on the planet Earth. Okay. that That's promising for a mass extinction. Yes. One thing that stands out, which will be familiar to people who have listened to, I mean, episode 15, episode 141. <laughs> uh, this was a time where the breakup of Pangaea was in full swing. Yep. Pangaea, the supercontinent that it was around at the time, was splitting and breaking up, fragmenting into the pieces that we have today, which means there was lots of tectonic activity. The, sh the literal shape of the surface of the Earth was changing. The most common effect of this that I've seen, I saw discussed in relation to this life transition is what this meant for the change in sea level. Oh. Uh, in, along with this changing of the shape of the continental landmass, there was a regression, a drop in sea level. This is important because what this seems to have done is fragmented aquatic habitats. So as sea level drops, if you have inland seas, if you had connections between oceans, if you had channels and, and passages... A lot of those would have been lost yeah. as the sea level dropped low enough that now they were either dry land in between or too shallow for certain things to make it across. Which is interesting because you, you might think that breaking up Pangaea, the, the supercontinent, would make more connections between waterways. But if you are also lowering your water level, mm -hmm. you're going to get a mixture of that. Yes, eventually... It would have made more connections between waterways. Yep. But at the start, when the sea level was dropping faster than the new oceans were opening. Yeah, then the continents were moving. Yes. <laughs> this, if you remember back to earlier in the episode, I pointed out that a lot of fossil sites are very distinct from each other from around the boundary. This is probably one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. Because different habitats in different parts of the world, especially ocean habitats, were being separated from each other. They were being isolated. You weren't getting migration and trans transit between different parts of the world. And that means that our fossil sites are very distinct in terms of what is preserved there, which is one of the things that makes it hard to identify where the boundary is. Also, as bodies of water shrink, so there were a lot of like shallow inland seas, as bodies of water shrink, that can mess with the chemistry of the, of the water. Yes. Right. That can mess with your salinity. It can uh, create a loss of nutrition. It can create anoxic conditions, right? Lowered oxygen. Yep. Which, of course, can wreak havoc with the ecosystems that live in those parts of, uh, in those bodies of water. One study that I found uh, was even examining how at this time period, they were looking at the geochemical carbon signal from different fossil sites around this time period. Mm -hmm. So your ratios of carbon isotopes will vary depending on what the carbon cycle was doing, right? How much carbon was being sequestered or sh moved through the atmosphere or the water and so on. And this study had noted that the fossil seaways in the northern parts of the world, the carbon signature became separated from the carbon signature in lower latitude oceans. Oh, that like different parts of the world were operating on a different carbon cycle. They Weird. weren't interacting as much anymore. So the geochemistry of those habitats became more distinct. That That is weird. That's cool. Yeah. So this lowering of sea level seems to have been causing a lot of, we'll, we'll call this provincialism. Mm -hmm. You have provinces around the world that are being very different. But of course, on the other hand, provincialism also creates a lot of isolation, Yep, which can be an opportunity for speciation, for new species to diverge and develop, uh, which we've talked about a number of times in the past. When things get separated on islands, for example, they have a habit of diverging and evolving into forms different from their continental relatives. Yeah, you can no longer mix your DNA with your overall group, so your DNA is going to very likely diverge. Also at this time period, there is evidence of a dramatic climate shift. The late Jurassic, I've seen described as generally in a lot of the places where we have evidence for it, more dry, arid and semi-arid, mm -hmm. shifting towards a more humid early Cretaceous. All so right. we've got climate conditions changing. 
There's also apparently some evidence of decreased temperatures near the boundary. So a cold snap, basically. So we've got climate changes that seem to be happening at the time. Also, uh, and here's one that I, I was taken a little bit by surprise because you always, right, asteroid impact is always like, yep. Uh, we, ever since we discovered that that one did that thing that one time. Yep. We're always looking for it. Uh, apparently there are multiple large craters. Oh, really? Known from at or near the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. Uh, I, I had seen it mentioned that People had looked to this time mm -hmm. to see if an impact. I didn't know there was multiple potential. Like, yeah. Huh. There are apparently a bunch of different sized ones, but I saw three specifically referred to as big. Like you could potentially implicate them in a mass extinction big all around the world. One in Australia, one in South Africa, and one in Norway. The one in Norway is called Mjolnir Crater, which, yeah. Oh, man. I don't remember the name of the other two craters because they weren't Mjolnir Crater. Because, yeah, you, you dropped the ball on naming your other two. <laughs> That's where it landed. Yeah, no, That's you're going to Stan, big Stan Lee truck. broke his pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got asteroid bolide impact craters uh, from around this time. Now, we've brought this up before. It is always very difficult to line up. The timing is always an issue to yes. say... Did this crater happen at the exact same time that we're seeing these ecological changes? Because if not, then maybe they weren't quite related. Yeah. But finding big craters at this transitional time, it could certainly implicate that there were uh, ecological effects of those asteroid impacts, even if they were not end Cretaceous yes. level. But like, even though we cannot for sure go, oh, yep, that happened at exactly the right time. Which should not be ignored right. when discussing this barrier, this boundary. So we've got continental shifting, we've got sea level drops, we've got climate shifts, and we've got a potentially multiple asteroid impacts at this time. And surprisingly, those are the only things of note at this boundary. I'm just kidding. Large Igneous Province! I was about to... I was going to walk out of, of this course, episode. Of course there's Large Igneous Provinces. Just, what, how, do we, how can we even justify <laughs> We're talking about periods. a major transition <laughs> in the fossil record and the geologic record. Of course, there were big all volcanoes. So for those of you who are new to the concept... A large... <laughs> What's happening right now? <laughs> what, did I miss a joke? You did, actually. Uh, large igneous provinces are regions with layer upon layer of stacked igneous deposits that are laid down by preposterous amounts of volcanic activity. Yeah, cooled lava from lots and lots and lots of volcanoes being active over a big area for a long time. Yes. Hence province. Yes. They leave behind a province <laughs> of igneous rock. There are multiple large igneous provinces still around today that date back to at or near the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary. There's the Parana Etendeca Traps, which is a large igneous province that today is spread across South America and Africa. Wow. Because that was before they mm -hmm. split apart. And there's the Otong Java Plateau which is in the Southwest Pacific. Both of these date back to the early Cretaceous. All right. And it has been noted that they don't quite line up with all the major declines, that it, the timing's not quite as nice as we'd like it to be, to be able to point and say, there it is, that's Aha. the one that did it. But massive volcanic activity can certainly cause atmospheric disruption, uh, they me absolutely mess with water. They mm -hmm. they can vent toxic gases and chemicals into the water, into the air. They can be linked to anoxia, uh, to lowered oxygen. A lot of the same things that an asteroid impact can cause. Yes. So all this together is to say that what we're seeing at this transition is a bunch of biological shifting, along with a bunch of different environmental changes that could have caused a mixture of global and regional impacts. Mm -hmm. So some of these things might have only actually been if, if affecting things in one area. Yeah. Right? If there, this volcanic activity might only really have affected things nearby it. Not necessarily like the Chicxulub impactor, right? The end Cretaceous 
where one asteroid impact, because of what it was and where it hit and when it hit, was able to basically have a ripple effect across the whole world. Yep. A lot of these might have been more regional. Which brings us to another candidate for what might be causing this, and that is that it could be that some of these changes we're seeing in the life at this time are being caused by other changes we're seeing in the life at this time. Oh, that you're getting a, a cascading and event. A cascade, absolutely. And that's the word I have written right here in my yes. notes. Yes. An ecological cascade. For example, we see declines and turnovers or changes in fish ecosystems around this time. We also see extinctions and turnovers in marine predators. Those could be linked to each other. It yes. could be that the fish changed and that led to turtles and plesiosaurs and sharks experiencing changes. Uh, similarly, there are changes in plants going on at this time, which could be linked to insect radiations mm -hmm. at this time. The radiation of insects eating leaves might be because plants changed and that spurred that insect radiation. When it comes to turnover, especially in animals, right? It, like I'll, I'll bring up stegosaurs again. We have stegosaurs, stegosaurs decline, and chylosaurs come into their own. Whenever you see something like that, there's always this dichotomy to consider between competitive displacement, mm -hmm. which is a new thing came in and pushed out the old thing, or opportunistic replacement. Yep. The, the old one went extinct, which opened up space for something new to move in. Those can be very difficult to distinguish between, and they both could have been happening here. Yes. Like, you can you can have a situation where a, a species has a decline in their numbers and in some regions starts to disappear, which allows another group to start to step into those regions and live a similar life to that species. Mm -hmm. But then if they start getting successful, they could start pushing out the first species yes. in further areas as their numbers increase and they become successful. This has been a major discussion, and we've brought this up. Episode 37 and 79 for sure had this. When it comes to pterosaurs and birds, is it a coincidence that the small pterosaurs seem to disappear around the same time that birds are on the rise? Mm -hmm. Did they outcompete one one over the other? Did Was it eco-space opened up? Or I've seen some discussion that points out that Cretaceous pterosaurs the big pterosaur, so we have big pterosaurs in the Jurassic, big ones in the Cretaceous, small ones in the Jurassic, and they kind of disappear and birds show up in the Cretaceous. But even the big pterosaurs seem to be living different ways in the Cretaceous than they were in the Jurassic. Mm -hmm. So it might not be as simple as one replaced the other. It could be that the whole aerial ecosystem reorganized it shifted around this time. Everyone did something different. So it could be that we're seeing these long, protracted changes. Maybe at various places at various times, there was a starting cause, right? Sea level dropped, and that caused trouble in this one body of water. Or an asteroid impact hit, and it caused a disturbance over here. And then those disturbances just cascaded through time. The plants changed, then the insects changed, then the flying animals that ate the insects changed. Or the water got messed up, so it caused the fish to react. And then when the fish reacted, it meant that they're predator. We could be seeing several million years of drawn out ecological responses to things that were happening before them. Which is an interesting concept, because then it means that you, if you changed what your region of time that you accepted for a mass extinction was, you could be seeing... A, a massive level of extinctions, but it's been stretched out because differing events happened throughout the time and you had cascading responses to previous events that dominoed through this time mm -hmm. to cause this overall shift. So it, your, your time scale might be what's making things weird, not the absence or presence yes. of a thing. And then, of course... A final note about things that can cause uh, mass extinction is that the incompleteness of the fossil record. Yep. As we mentioned earlier, a lot of these signals are unclear. Yes. A lot of what's going on here needs to be further investigated, further sampled. It could be that there 
that some of these trends are more normal, more recognizable than we see them right now, because we just don't have the right fossil sites for it, or our timing's not quite there. And it could be that certain changes weren't as dramatic as historically we've thought that they were. Yeah, if we find a number of nicer fossil sites and realize that actually the decline of stegosaurs stretched out a lot farther or mm-hmm. was was more robust at the end than we thought it was. Right. That's now the the ending of that story, the ending of that line is a different scenario than we thought it was. And like I pointed out earlier, that's been happening Yep. Uh, with a lot of these different groups. Now, to be fair, that happens with all extinction events. Yes. Uh, we're always discovering new things. This one is just extra intriguing and complex. It seems to be a lot of dramatic ecological change stretched out over a period of 5, 10, 15, 20 million years that results in this really interesting, really mysterious, and kind of fuzzy border between these two time periods. I feel like... This is a great example and a great reminder that just because we note a trend in science in general, but, you know, in, in this case, the the geological, the history, historical events of our planet, just because we note a trend doesn't mean that that trend is absolute. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean that that trend has to be followed. It's just what we have noticed to be the typical case for these scenarios that very often Boundary distinctions have some sort of very distinct event, a mass extinction or massive shift in the ecosystem that you can see clearly because it was dramatic as far as geologic time goes. It happened over a very short amount of time, not hundreds of millions, but thousands of years. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to happen that way. Your change could happen slowly and take millions of years. That doesn't make the change any more distinct. Once you finally get to the end of it, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to follow the model that we've come to notice. And it is very easy as humans to then say, well, then what's wrong with it? You know, right. What, what is, what is, why is it weird? Yes. What, what is off about this? And well, it might not, it might not be off. Our strict definition might be our expectations. Exactly. So I like this as a, a, a reminder for that. Yeah. So to address some of the questions we asked throughout the episode, was there a mass extinction at the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary? Uh, Maybe, kind of, a little bit. What caused it? Uh, (laughs) Probably a lot of stuff. Yeah, there's a bunch going on. (laughs) Uh, When does the Jurassic end? Somewhere before the Cretaceous. (laughs) Eventually. (laughs) Uh, This is is one of those fascinating topics where this is something that will continue to develop. Like, now I know to be on the lookout. Right. I'm anticipating that sometime in the next several years, there may be a paper that goes, right, a proposal for the mm-hmm. timing of the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary, or this group of animals went extinct, actually, at this time, or they didn't. Go- so like, this is this is a the kind of mysterious area of our field that just means that there's cool discoveries left to be made. I'd be very excited since you mentioned that much of our information comes from a fairly small number of very good fossil sites Mm -hmm. that the discovery of a new fossil site around this time you know if we find like a really nice fossil site in like south america yeah that could be a huge game changer that could be an entirely new view into this this Mm -hmm. event in this time period that could shift things and i'd be very interested to see what we would learn from something like that yeah well before we wrap up officially For this episode, we have one last thing to do, and that is our patron question. These days, every episode, we wrap up by answering a question submitted by one of our patrons on Patreon. That's one of the special things you get to do on Patreon is submit questions to fill out our list of patron questions, which we answer, as I mentioned, right here at the end of the episode. (laughs) Will, what's our patron question? Our question today is from Logan, who says, Regarding the possibility of T-Rex being an ambush hunter, Is it possible that they, like elephants, had some cushioning on their feet that made them very quiet for their size? Oh, this is a question that is related not to the topic of the episode, but to the topic of one of our news items. Yeah! Convenient. So, could T-Rex have had cushioning on its feet? Uh, I mean, going back to our discussion from earlier in the news, large animals benefit from having cushioning on their feet because it helps absorb the, the shock. But also a lot of small animals have cushioning on their feet. Absolutely. Dogs and cats 
right? The the their toe beans, their pads, their digital pads. They're called digital pads. Those are doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Those are shock absorbers. They are taking some of the stress out of each step so that it's not affecting the feet. Uh, and I know that digital pads, to some degree, have been observed in a lot of dinosaur footprints. Yes. So we will see a similar pattern there as we see in a lot of modern animals. Absolutely. So T-Rex almost certainly would have had some degree of padding on its feet because a a lot of animals seem to, uh, and it probably would have needed padding to help with being gigantic. Mm -hmm. As for whether or not that would help it be an ambush hunter, I don't know if the padding makes animals quieter. Well, and I I think it's also, there definitely are adaptations to feet that can help with stuff like that. Like, Mm -hmm. I know that there are some predators in certain environments that have particularly furry feet to muffle sound. I I can't remember, it was either the snow leopard or clouded leopard, or one of those that, both for insulation, but also it's supposed to be extremely quiet with their footsteps. Hmm. Uh, But I think it's also good here to emphasize what does ambush mean. Because if you are ambushing ambush typically means sit and wait right you set up an ambush you know in a, in a military sense we set up our trap here and then we hope the enemy walks into it right and a lot of ambush hunters like you know rattlesnakes yes. are ambush hunters they sit in a place where they expect food to come by so stealth you know in the sense of how quiet are you moving is typically in a that is a prowling you are pursuing your prey or trying to get as close as you can before you strike, but you are moving toward it. Which, to be fair, is sometimes I've seen referred to as ambush hunting. Because it's still a surprise attack. It's not pursuit predator, like a wolf chasing things over long distances. Uh, But yes, surprise attack, there's a lot, there's a spectrum. Oh yeah, there's definitely depends (laughs) on how you define what you mean by ambush. Right. So if the pads do help with noise, which... Like you said, I don't know how much that's been studied. It, right. Because I don't know that that's the case with elephants. I, 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 I do know they are very quiet. Right. They I don't do know move around very quietly. Because of mm-hmm. the padding on the feet. Uh, I think that it's very easy, especially when we watch movies. Like Jurassic Park does this. A lot of movies do this. To get the impression that an animal the size of T-Rex or a sauropod would have inevitably been thoom every yep. time it took a step. Which probably isn't true because that's not what animals today do yeah you even can, similarly sized animals you can move around surprisingly quietly just by being careful like a mm-hmm. bear like if you watch a video of a bear a lot of time <laughs> they are surprisingly quiet when so they're I, being careful i think it comes down to technique yes a lot of the time because uh, padding and especially in the forest padding's not going to help you muffle the crunching of leaves right, crunching of leaves snapping of twigs yeah that said, I'm sure that if T-Rex was sneaking up on prey, it would have had adaptations to help it. Yes. Behavioral adaptations to walk quietly and slowly and, and, and carefully. Visible adaptations, perhaps, to help it camouflage. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe feathering or scales that had patterns on them so that it was less noticeable. Uh, I don't know how much pads on the feet yeah. would contribute to that. Another way, just for your own mental exercises, if you're continuing to think about this, is if T-Rex was ambushing less like a cat, but more like a croc, it could have been that T-Rex would find a clearing in the trees that it knew was a a, a herbivore path Mm -hmm. and just huddled down in the trees beside it. And maybe T-Rex was really good at just sitting there for a week. And then when herbivores came through, it would come out and try to grab one as fast as it could. Right. And in that case, you don't need to be quiet. You just need to be patient. Yeah. So depending on what form of surprise attack you're picturing depends on what tools you need or what's important about your detection. Now you just don't want to be seen. So you need camouflage and you need stillness. I like this kind of question because it it, it spurs us to think about a very broad variety of things Mm -hmm. beyond the content of the question itself. Yes. Which is a lot of fun. Absolutely. Good question. Thank you, Logan, for that question. Thank you to those of you who requested this episode topic. Thank you to all of our listeners and to our patrons and to everybody who has been participating in the various ways we interact with our community. 
We're going to wrap the episode up there. So before we go, some reminders. We're going to be at Dragon Con. Yeah. Having a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll be able to post some of our Dragon Con stuff on our uh, on the podcast, maybe on YouTube afterwards. So stay tuned for yep, that. Yep. And you can check the schedules. They'll be putting out schedules so that you can see what times we'll be and where we'll be if you're interested in coming to see our panels. Yes, stay tuned for updates on things coming later in the year. For example, Spooky, <laughs> as well as upcoming episodes. Check the episode description if you want to encounter us on social media, on Discord. We started a Discord server at the beginning of this year, and it's been going great. Check the blog. Every episode has a blog post with links and photos and info for those of you who want to dive deeper. All that kind of information and more down in the episode description. We release episodes every fortnight. We sure do. And we will continue to do that because it is what you demand. Yep. Uh, keep sending us things you want us to talk about and we'll keep talking about them. And the phrase we release episodes every fortnight is the global stratotype yes. boundary point uh, that marks the end of an episode. Yeah. Yes, it is. That's how you know that. That's how you know that we're <laughs> about to ramble a little bit. Yep. Yep. And then the music will start playing. And if we you could be like done. analyze our entire catalog for that <laughs> phrase, you'd be within a couple to few minutes. Of yes. The end. Every single time. Yeah, most of our episodes are more like the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary, where it's drawn out at yeah. the end. There's definitely a cascading event <laughs> of dialogue. <laughs> Join us next time. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.